Hey y'all, Clem Hawkins here. Just checking in and figuring now's a good time to document what the hell's going on with life as a residentially challenged urban camper. As a minimalist, you gotta have what you gotta have. So let's flip this around if we can. Oh, it ain't let me flip it around. Okay, well, here we have a laptop and power supply. Here we have bedroll, warm thingy, new bag, jacket and beverages, backpack, notebook, toiletries, medicine, change of clothes. Knee brace, waterproofer thing, speaker, frisbees, another waterproofy thing down there. Oh, there's the change of clothes. Glasses with bifocal and bifocal earbuds. Two phones and a couple of water bottles. And I just got this cool spongy thing so I can clean this one out. It seems protein juice uh, does not like Nalgene bottles or really likes Nalgene bottles and goes in there and tastes all gnarly and stuff. So, yeah, anyway, I'm going to go in the stream. A little waterfall out of the sewer over there. Over by the train tracks. Sundays, when the weather's perfect, is a really hard time to hide from people. But it's a nice clear stream. Over yonder is where Google is building its new complex. You can see at least two cranes. Pretty radical. So yeah, I wanted to document uh, minimalist life. Oh yeah, I forgot this is here, is with the bike. Uh, oh, I forgot about the bliss, half of the blissware. But in here I have air pump, a couple of inner tubes, uh, emergency tool, and this other bag here. This is IOTSI work tools. 30 ounce cup. Looks like a smiley face. And lights up. So I'm legal. I also have a rebu Oh, that's what I wanted to recharge today. Funny thing about remembering stuff you forgot. Hopefully I won't forget it the next time. So I was gonna head to my spot early. If I do that, it'll fall through. If I do this. So it's been a couple minutes since I've done any broadcasts or podcasts and I'm not sure if this will be capable, but I thought where it is I might be getting a place in the next week. So I will go from residentially challenged living in a vehicle to residentially challenged urban camping on a bicycle. And it's not so easy to live off of a, out of a bicycle as it is a vehicle. Granted, it's a lot less expensive. With the exception, food costs a lot more because without home preparation, just coffee in and of itself, three times three is nine, meaning that it's $90 just for coffee every morning, not including refill or tip food on a daily basis ten to fifteen dollars 
So there's 20 bucks right there. Two times three is six. That's six hundred dollars. That's basically my income, not including tobacco and weed costs. Fortunately, I'm frugal, so I go to the clubs where I get the good deals on the bud shake and the jar shake, and I pay less for not buying the stick and the big pretty flower, just the crumbs, and the crumbs smoke just fine by me, since I roll my own. I was giving it a lot of thought earlier try to do it straight if I can but thinking about the 13 years journey with Elvis that he showed up in my reality about or not long after maybe my mom tells me that she found out she was wolf clan of the Cherokee tribe which means that I would be wolf club wolf clan wolf clan are teachers and so to have a spiritual wolf a physical wolf spiritual wolf guide me around on my earth walk for 13 years was uh is still a blessing because i keep learning from it remembering to appreciate all the moments in between the moments and uh I learned a lot in a big picture sort of way. Probably one of the first things that Elvis taught me and helped me with people is that at least Elvis, maybe most dogs, understand yes much more than they understand no. So teaching a dog how to do something with positive versus negative reinforcement just dropped a phone that I didn't want to break. Dollars just done it. Didn't. Yeah, it didn't break. Been trying to find a case for that thing. Residentially challenged. I realized just the other day I'm more of an urban camper now. I guess I haven't done any reporting or documenting on the last however long. If I treated it like a harvest, I'd have to start 13 months ago. But thinking about Elvis, it'd be 13 years ago. And so, 13 years ago, I was up in Northern California. Pretty sure I was working for Miss Gypsy at the India Bazaar, Bazaar of India. It used to be a gas station, and she converted it into a little gypsy shop. Had all of the belly dancer clothes. Basically, she spent six months of her year in Goa, India, buying up stuff for cheap, bringing it to the States, and then selling it during festival season and tourist season up and down the 101. And probably didn't hurt that I worked there and then when she left for India, she, she either left it open or left me a key to the bathroom. So I stayed there that winter, and that's the 
the winter that Elvis found me. After Elvis found me, we soon thereafter left Laytonville for Garberville. Spent an extra season there, I recall, to be able to teach Elvis hand signals and other necessities. When it came to festivals, I had an issue with him not being certified as a service dog. So we had to stick to working crows and other things like that. And after one season of working a grow, we were gifted a car and ended up driving it back to Missouri to live in the basement of my friend Curtis's house so I could get my driver's license back and try to rebuild from there. Worked at a brewery, got a gig rehabbing a place, and then that collapsed with the upstairs Republican party member people getting me evicted, basically, by threatening not to pay rent until I was gone. All because I was remodeling downstairs before I remodeled upstairs. It was silly, but that got us out of there, um, back on the road. And I'm pretty sure it was in Texas at a gas station. A truck stop lady suggested I go see my sister who had gotten married and lived in Santa Fe. And when I was there, the car broke down. So Elvis and I spent our next five years in and around Santa Fe. If it weren't for Elvis, I wouldn't have met as many cool people as I met. And that's for darn sure. And heck, if it weren't for Elvis, I probably wouldn't have spoke to many people on a day-to-day -day basis. Since he's gone, I realize the only people I pretty much talk to are people that I buy coffee from or whatever, and I'm not particularly interested in talking to them either. But I am reminded that our path is a lesson for others that may traverse it and you could call this path a number of different paths because where I sit in my situation currently understand it was, was it January 3rd? Couldn't have been, you know, it must have been 13th, 10th, 11th, I don't know. It was in January that I got the opportunity to spend 88 days in county for a previous DUI per se and after being released with nothing but the clothes on my back basically since the car had gotten towed all of my possessions which were in the car got towed and crushed or otherwise dispersed of at the junkyard or tow yard including Elvis's ashes, all my computers, uh, work tools, clothes, gear, etc. But the thing I was thinking about today is once you've lost everything, it's easy to lose everything again because it's simple stuff. I've been stressing on losing stuff at the locker. It's mostly winter stuff that I had at the, the shelter, but unwilling, as you see, my pack is pretty much full anyway as a one-horse man. That was another thing I remember. That might have been right about the same time Elvis found me. There's this gorgeous woman, I mean like Indian Nepalese goddess, just amazingly beautiful, could have been a princess or a queen of some country, but she was uh, admiring and or appreciating me as a one horse man, a person who had everything that he owned that one horse could carry 100% complete, kind of makes you re 
think it's probably the first time that I rethought the whole conscious awareness or social stigma of homelessness because a homeless person is free to move and travel and isn't stuck by schedule and or routine. Granted, I find some relief in schedule and routine myself personally and the anxiousness to get my own space to do my own schedule and my own routine is of utmost importance and has been for the last shit six weeks or something. I'm aware mostly that the move in is never cheap or free and once I get there I'm going to have a bunch of errands as far as a new post office box, an eco bus pass, a visit to social security to report all the changes and then I have to start getting back to physical therapy but since work is pretty much drying up for the season and I'm about over it anyway I've said it or thought it a bunch of times but a lot of the people that work with that stagehand union make Bill Graham Presents BGP Productions make them look like professionals and those guys I don't care what anybody does on their own time but if you can do whatever you do and then you can show up and function just fine you got no beef with me I got no beef with you but if you can't even show up sober as a clam and uh, do your job I mean a lady with 35 some odd years supposedly tells me all that I mean she she t tied a bowline or didn't tie a bowline but tried to tie a bowline that basically almost failed dropping about I don't know, 150 pounds of motor and chain on whoever was underneath it. Then she puts the bags on backwards so all the chains fall on all of the motors almost simultaneously. It was about classic. I recorded it on audio. I should have been recording video. That would have been funnier. Like, look, this is the kind of clowny shit that I put up with at work. But I'm done putting up with it and it ain't going to change, so I guess I'm kind of done with working there, which is just fine by me because my rent is one-third of my income, so the cheaper my income, the better my rent. It's retarded, but it's the system we live in. So yeah, when I move in, I'll get, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'll have a sleeping bag and a bedroll and another blanket and one change of clothes and another outfit of shorts plus i have i think in total three lockers at work mostly of which is clothes and or paperwork some of the paperwork is notes from the 88 days and counting and the idea is that i have regularly done and experienced a lot of stuff that other people might otherwise be interested in possibly not always the results but the reality and the thought process because I'm reminded that not only when you stop and think you realize that a lot of people don't also, not everyone acknowledges or accepts that life is a spiritual journey and we're here to experience and learn stuff. I mean, at the very worst, at the end of it all, uh, if your life flashes before your eyes, then my assumption would be the journey would be to have as much fun along the way so when you die you get to experience it again. And since time becomes irrelevant, you might get to live that life three or four times over. I've always wondered what would happen if you could go back and make all your other decisions. But then the path that we take in our life, I visualize as a lightning bolt. And when I look back on my life and I think of certain ideas or certain interests or certain energies that I extended, those were like the little frayed part of the lightning bolt. Uh, the life 
path that we live is the flash that's the main part maybe i don't know maybe it's all of it maybe you know what i'm saying maybe we're out here exploring fractals and we're not even aware of it yet but if we can map fractals and then map the lands of alternate consciousness regardless of three-dimensionalisms that's a whole different side avenue alley or what have you and I guess I don't know about you but I'd rather see that than The idea when I started this whole podcasting thing, shit, was it a year, was it two years ago, uh, was to, I mean, 20 years ago when I started my whole adventure as a residentially challenged hippie critic in 99, July 4th, 99, uh, wrote about it in American Misfits, then followed that up with Blissware, still working to finish that one, um, the idea is that when I was younger I learned from a lot of other authors and writers who had stories and if I crossed them all together that's about what I got as far as an experience goes and I'm not sure if that means that to pay back in a forward reciprocating way it's important to write about my experiences journeys and travels in the book Celestine Prophecy James Redfield's character experiences and goes on an adventure and throughout the adventure discovers new enlightenments that lead to new enlightenments and show the path to true enlightenment over a series of steps as opposed to a single bound. But I think about Carlos Castaneda and Don Juan and all of that when the guy wrote about what happened and later he rewrote about it to try to explain it better and still a lot of people misunderstood that his parables were parables they weren't literal that just because they were written down doesn't mean that they were literal I don't know how to put it but a great abyss that you leap into is a great unknown it's something that you don't know anything about you just release and let go it's the same way as being adopted or abducted by the grateful dead family if you fight it it's just going to be no fun so might as well ride along with it and keep on trucking recently i got to meet the new prince of the wrecking crew i suppose he touted himself as the new fast eddie in rack and uh, I managed to avoid being abducted a second time. It didn't seem to make a few people very happy. Why would you turn down a job like that? But something told me I had better things to do. So if the psychedelic and or spiritual trip is all about the set and the setting, the challenge is creating your set and your setting. Uh-oh, this is going to be really loud. Set the set and the setting. This is the best set and setting I've found in Boulder yet that predominantly avoids riffraff in the element. In a second, when this train goes by, you'll hear why, because it's loud as can be. And I'm not sure. I guess the thing I was going to do is uh, maybe we'll let the train go by.
basically he's done with that horn. I hear the train a coming. It's rolling down the track. I like about train cars is they're all different. Some of them are the same. Oh look, no caboose. But uh, they, um, it's like people, right? Each train car is a different person, so each person has a different kind of stuff on it, which that's that person's abilities or talents or characteristics or qualities. Let's see if that'll stay up there. So yeah, uh, I, I started a page writing the Residentially Challenged page on the Facebook with the idea of keeping an online journal. Then I learned about a blog is a web log. It's logging your activities on the web. And I'm aware that Google now follows me and all of my devices. So that's taken care of still. Uh, I've been anxiously waiting and planning and trying to get ready to move into a place to turn into an office and get some work done and start not only earning my keep but spreading some love and getting some uh, positive messages and other ideas out there. And uh, it's not been easy, that's for sure. And I've made tons of mistakes along the way. And hopefully once it's all said and done, I can acknowledge that everybody's going to, okay, you could, let's imagine that your best destination is the top of a mountain. And everybody is aware that there's a certain path to get to the top of that mountain. And once you get to the top of that mountain, you take a picture. And then you get down to the bottom of that mountain and then you have a picture that reminds you of the view from that mountain but it also reminds you of the path up that mountain and then back down to that mountain from that mountain so the picture is worth more than a thousand words if you're a stoner sativa smoker like me I'm just now feeling, and I'm not sure how I feel it, but um, I've been going through what felt like a really good wind of creativity and productivity and accomplishment as far as getting all my businesses in order into one conglomerate of a function. And a lot of the DIY do-it-yourself movement is, I'm from Missouri, it's a show-me state, so I'm showing you, you can do a podcast without a fancy microphone, without a fancy desk, without any of that other stuff, again. It is all about the set and the setting, and it's also what the viewers are comfortable with and or come accommodated to or used to. Uh, still, the idea is that the podcast should carry a feeling of them being in the room with you. It's like when you were in high school and you went to your dealer's house, depending on what time you got there, depended on what seat you got, the further away from the dealer were, the longer it took you to get served. So, sitting on the couch, listening to music, watching TV, doing stoner things, 
seems like the perfect set and setting for the podcast. I'm not sure if I've spoken it or documented it, but I've recently attempted anyway to set up DreamSpace Productions webpage and group on the Facebook as to link (coughs) Dimwit Publishing, (coughs) the publishing company (coughs) whose purpose is to copyright all the stuff that DreamSpace Productions makes, including the Except No Limitations podcast, <coughs> which you may or may not be watching right now. Well, right now you're not watching it because it doesn't exist yet, but we're working on that. It's a, it's a time travel joke. You'll get it in a minute. I'm anxious to see the physicality of the plans I have in regards to sciencing the comedy out of it and discovering mathematically that you can divide two minutes into 13 bits 10 seconds long basically each bit is nine seconds long so that's enough time for one or three maybe question mark one liners I'm talking like it's word text to speech sorry about that one two three 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 one two three